Exodus International, that was a, uh, an umbrella for all kinds of ministries helping uh, people who feel same-sex attraction, uh, transgenderism, all these things that are confusing right now in our culture. And uh, it's beautiful to see people who have stood. Uh, the lady who is uh, the president of Hope for Wholeness, I went down actually as a volunteer. It's kind of like, a, like an alcoholic who no longer needs to go to AA meetings, but you go uh, to help the others like Dick Johnson used to do. And uh, every time I go, I, every single person should go to one of these rallies because if you want to see what Christ can do, the transforming power of Jesus Christ, especially in a day when all the forces of the culture and uh, the, uh, even within the church are opposing you. They, had, they, they were saying they were going to have about 500 protesters uh, at this event uh, that was at uh, the City View Church in uh, San Diego. They didn't have that many. There's a lot of young people with a rainbow flag and stuff in front of the in front of the church. And all I could do was feel pity for them because I thought they are just so they they have no idea. <laughs> they don't have an idea. And uh, but it's amazing what God can do. And and again with the confusion we have with right now, what could Satan do better than to blur the lines of gender? Yeah, you know, your your gender is is a sacred thing, male and female. God created us. Uh, the human race, and you're either male or female, and the, and the enemy will come in and they will blur, he will blur those lines, and uh, 
probably the biggest misnomer is to call homosexual people gay. Because that word used to mean happy, you know. And, and it was a good life. I, I, years ago when I was in college, I heard a man by the name of Merle Miller. And he, at that time, was a retired uh, editor of the New York Times. And um, he had, quote unquote, come out of the closet. He was an older man. And, and, and that is exactly what he said. He said, anybody who calls this life gay or good, it's anything but that. But, but Jesus, you know what the Bible has, what you'll see the phrase, but God. You know, with men it is impossible, comma, but not, you know, but not with God. With God all things are possible. But you'll see such and such and such and such, but God, you know, you know. You've heard it said, but I say. Yeah. We live in a completely different world when we're in Jesus. And again, I come away from these places and hear other people's stories. And I've heard these things for years. And I've kind of worked in this field off and on a, a bit for 20, over 20 some years. And, and then I see, uh, hear other people's testimonies and I just go, wow. Yeah. Wow. Little girl who thought she was a little boy, she said from the time she was four years old, thought she, she was sure she was a little boy. Went into a boy's room one time when she was in uh, grade school and saw urinals and just had a fixation on urinals and on male genitalia. She just thought that that's what, that would make her complete. I mean, that's really a mess, you know. <laughs> and, and how you can go through that throughout your life, be attracted to women and then hear this woman that found Jesus and feels complete in her womanhood now and has attractions for men, but oh, with men it's impossible. And so we have people that protest, protesting somebody's choice to walk the way they want to write, they want to walk. You know, we hear about being inclusive. Uh, we hear about, and, and, you know, and we're the ones that are called unloving. We're the ones that are called narrow-minded, and yet they're protesting our right to walk for Jesus. You know? So, yeah. The Lord is incredible. I actually, you know, I'm thinking about it before we start our, before we get into the real sermon today, I have a, some photos from Marcy, and they've been sitting up here forever. Uh, hey, you know what else? Uh, I need a couple of you gentlemen, I think Samuel, if you'll take a basket, and Gary, if you'll take the other basket. We have some Father's Day gifts, so we're going to distribute those. There's a choice of all kinds of things, from snacks to shaving cream, all those manly things. Uh, it's not, so, it's not the baby. It's not the baby bottles, is it? You know, what's that? Not the baby bottles. Yeah, no, no, and not, nothing behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you distribute those for a moment. Oh no! Every man take one because you are a spiritual father. Like we say on Mother's Day, if you're a mother or you have a mother. If your mother. You're entitled to a Mother's Day gift. <coughs> oh yeah. A little health food. There's little snacks, you know. When I uh, uh, I picked up some bags yesterday at the conference lunch, and like some Cheetos. You know, those little bags you get like the sandwiches. Shake. So I picked up a couple extra because I thought oh, these will come beer. in handy. And I think yeah. I had about six bags of those things in the car, and I thought I'll just. I'll eat those later. Yeah. You're on that five and a half hour trip from Boston, <laughs> San Diego. Yeah. Next thing you know, I ate every bag of Cheetos, Doritos. <laughs> Long trip. Still stopped at Arby's. I told, I told Stephanie, I got to Barstow, I said, you know, I, I said, do you want to wait until I get home at 9 o'clock to eat? Or maybe not. I said, I'm going to need to eat just to, just to keep my sanity on this trip. So I had to stop at Arby's and get a couple of barbecues, you know. I'll do the food. So we'll let us start out for a few weeks here. We're, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to turn there in a few minutes if you want to uh, find chapter 20 now. Uh, but we're, we're going to talk today about abandon to, abandon by, and abandon to. Abandon by, and abandon to. And I'll kind of talk about what, what I'm talking about, what that means. We're going to look at times in our life when, and they come to all of us, when you will be abandoned by the company and the comfort of people. And sometimes we lose important people in our life to death. And many of us have been through that. Sometimes uh, just circumstances change in our life and friends 
move away, close people uh, move away, or a spouse, or a boyfriend, or a girlfriend deserts you, or a friend forsakes you, and you're alone, and you're devastated. And we're going to see this, that is what happens in David's life for a time. But you're not alone in Christ, even in those times. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, and surely I am with you always. Sometimes it doesn't seem like that. When you're, when you're in a lonely place, it is hard sometimes to feel God's presence. We'll talk a little bit about that. Hebrews 13, 5, and this is quoting Deut Deuteronomy, says this, God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And then there's a scripture that says, even if your mother and father would forget you or abandon you, I haven't forgotten you. And God says he's got our names tattooed, engraved on the palms of his hands. And if we're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, there are going to be times just like in Jesus' life where all will abandon us and we'll be there just us looking in the face of God. So there are times we feel ourselves abandoned, deserted, alone, and these are the opportunities to cling to God. To really get to know God in these abandoned places. Now it's interesting in our language that abandon can mean two completely opposite things. It can mean to leave, to give up, or to desert. You know, it was abandoned by, or abandon ship, you know, jump, you know, get in, get off the ship. You know, abandon, give up, give up. Or it can mean to give yourself over to, unrestrainedly. Both things. So you're either letting go, or someone lets go of you, or you cling to, I'm, I've abandoned myself to God. I've abandoned myself to this pursuit. So, being abandoned by should cause us to be abandoned to God. Now I'm going to give a little summary because 1 Samuel, is a long, 1 Samuel 20 is a long chapter. We know that Saul has been out to kill David. And David fears for his life. And so like any one of us, he goes to his closest, dearest friend. You go to someone you're close to. And he goes to his best friend, his closest friend, Jonathan, who happens, of course, to be son. King Saul's son. And he asks Jonathan, why is your father trying to kill me? And Jonathan says, oh, he's not trying to kill you. I'm with my dad all the time. He would, he would, if he were going to kill you, he would certainly tell me. But David reminds Jonathan, he says, your dad knows how close we are. He knows you're my best friend. He's not going to tell you because he knows you'll tell me. And I'll be warned and he won't be able to get me. So Jonathan says, all right, then I'll do whatever you suggest I do. So David tells Jonathan, he says, tomorrow night I'm supposed to have dinner with your dad. And he said, instead I'm going to hide out in the field for a couple of days. And when you go to dinner with your father, tell him, if he asks, that I went to Bethlehem to make a sacrifice. And if your dad responds, if everything's calm and he doesn't get upset, then I'll know I'm okay. But if he throws a, a fit, then I'm going to know it's not safe. And so David then takes Jonathan out to the field where he's going to hide, and he shows him his hiding place by a rock. And they pledge their friendship to one another, to each other. You ever pledge your friendship to anybody? I think about my sister and my one of our cousins, my cousin Terry. And when they were little girls, they would say, Oh, when we grow up, you know, I'm gonna be your I'm gonna be your best maid at your wedding, and you're gonna be my best maid, and our kids will play together, and they had this all figured out. And then we moved across the country. <laughs> and it didn't turn out exactly like that, but they're still very, very close. And that, that pledge was like over 50 years ago. We're always gonna be close to to each other. And so uh, David then shows Jonathan, this is where I'm going to hide in this field. And Jonathan says, okay, I will come back here in a couple days. And I'm going to pretend I'm doing target practice. And I'm going to shoot an arrow. And if the arrow goes to one side of you, then you'll know you're safe. And you can come out of hiding. But if the arrow goes beyond you, 
then you'll know you have to take off and get out of here. And so, Jonathan goes to have dinner the next night with his dad, and his dad never asks where David is. All was fine. The second night, he goes to have dinner with his dad again, and this teen time, King Saul asks where David is, and Jonathan explains to him that David has gone to um, make a sacrifice in Bethlehem, and then we pick up in 1 Samuel, uh, verse 30 of, of chapter 20, and we read about King Saul's reaction. So if you want to follow along, otherwise it'll be up on the screen. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't you know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. You know, when we walk away from the Lord, it's insanity. And this is what we see going on with King Saul. He, he, he's got murderous thoughts and he has no regard for God's law at all. He already knows that God has said, I'm stripping the kingdom from you. And he's taking matters into his own hands. I'm, I'm gonna, I am going to fight against God. Did you ever try to do that? Oh, no, not of you. No. I can just tell you this. I fought the Lord and the Lord won. I fought the Lord and the Lord won. I fought the Lord and the Lord won. I didn't know I was fighting the Lord when I fought the Lord. I thought what I was just doing was trying to do everything but what he was asking me to do. You know, I'll tithe. I'm doing a whole lot of other things, God. I just can't let go of this. And that's fighting God. And that's what Saul's doing. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled a spear at him to kill him. This is one of Saul's... He's just like Elvis with the pistol on the television set. You know, those of you who remember. Every, every time things don't go his way, here comes the spear. You know? His own son. Tried to kill his own son. That's insanity. And Jonathan knew that his father... Then, duh, then Jonathan knew. Then Jonathan knew that his father was trying to kill him. I don't know why that's in there. I think, <laughs> but I think it's because Jonathan was—he just couldn't imagine that his, you know, he was with his dad all the time. Is so in the morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. Verse 34. On the second day of the month, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. Man, that's that's a friend who who cares so much about you that he that you, they can't eat. You know, emotionally. Yeah. yeah. I'm close with many of you, but don't ask me. <laughs> I'd have to be very, 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 very upset. I feed a cold, I feed a fever. Yeah. I stand in front of a microwave and say, hurry. I've been known to put guacamole even on aspirin. In the morning, you know, they pierced my ear one time and gravy came out. Uh, all right. Enough of that. Are we done? <laughs> I'll tell you when we're done, Jim. All right. <laughs> Verse 35. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. He had a small boy with him, and he said to the boy, Run and find the arrows I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, hurry, go quickly, don't stop. The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. The boy knew nothing of all this, only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, go carry them back to town. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. And they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept most. Now, we have to understand the culture is different here. So, so men kissing each other, I'm sure it wasn't like right on the lips. It was you know, kiss on the cheek and uh, hugging. When I was in Thailand many years ago, uh, there were uh, soldiers, uh, Thai soldiers, and they would walk like four abreast and all be holding hands. Yeah, cultures are different. 
So, so we see David, uh, up until this point, we've seen this close, close devotion of Jonathan, but now we see David is the one who's heavily weeping because he knows they're going to be separated. He knows Jonathan is prince and he'll be staying with his father and David has to run from his father and he does not know how long it'll be until they see each other again. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to town. And we'll see that that vow of being faithful to their descendants that David will honor that years later with, with a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. Now when people choose biblical names, why don't they choose, why don't they name their baby Mephibosheth? <laughs> That's hard to call after a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so they part and David has no idea that he will for the next four years rarely see Jonathan. He may see him one time. In fact, you will see him, we know, at least one time. But it's highly unlikely that they saw each other more than once in the next four years, and then he has no idea that, that uh, Jonathan will die before he takes the throne. So David will spend four years on the run. And even though he'll go with, with a band of men, he's isolated because his best friend, his confident, is not with him. And, and he is the one Saul is searching for. So sometimes even when you're around other people, you're alone because they cannot know what you personally are going through. And that is abandoned by. And that's the time when God wants us to abandon ourselves to him. Oswald Chambers said this, a servant of God must stand so much alone that he never knows he is alone. In the first phases of Christian life, Disheartments come. People who used to be lights flicker out, and those who used to stand with us pass away. We have to get so used to that that we never know we are standing alone. Paul said in 2 Timothy, All men forsook me, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. We must build our faith, not on the fading light, but on the light that never fails. When big men go, we are sad until we see they are meant to go. The one thing that remains is looking in the face of God for ourselves. And, and you know what? That is the bottom line of our life in the Lord. Mama may have and Papa may have, but God bless the child that has his own we must have our own dynamic relationship with the Lord. You know, when I came to Christ, it was like, wow, God is alive. But people who are more mature in the Lord, I hear, <coughs> I hear an intimacy that I didn't know yet. And they would talk about God saying things to them, and I used to think, what? How's that happen? You know, God speaks to you? And I just, you know, I kept thinking it was a big voice or something. And I, but... I didn't understand back then that that took some time to move into that place of, of abandoning oneself more and more to God. Now we have to understand God never intended any of us to live a monastic life. You know, there's people who go off and live in a monastery. That's okay for a season, but we're to be among people and with people. God created marriage. It's His idea. God created the family. It's His idea. God created community. It's His idea. And He, made, he, he created the church. And, and we Amen. are, we need one another. Amen. Genesis 2.18. God said this. It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a, state, a suitable helper for him. You know, whether you're married or whether you're single, both of those calls are honorable places in the Lord. Not everybody has that help meet that we have if, if we're married. However, uh, we God has deliberately placed us so that we, we need other people. You know, we're just one part, like, like Paul says about the body. We're not all ears, we're not all eyes, we're not all feet, but, but we, and we can't operate without one another. However, 
there are times. I like Psalm 68, 6. I love this. God puts the lonely in families. I really believe that, that in the body of Christ, whatever the situation is, God will bring people. If you've lost a husband, uh, whatever the situations are, there are times when, when you're kind of alone, and God will just always bring uh, support for us. Puts the lonely in family. I've never been, I've had times of loneliness, but I've had a blessing because I had a close family growing up, and then when I did a career with my sister and brother, we were together like all the time, so I always had it was hard to be alone. I'd go home from the shows different nights. I'd be with them in the shows and then get home, get a shower, and there'd be something on television. I'd pick up the phone and you know, I'd be calling my sister and my brother. And so there was always that going on. But 20 some years ago, I moved back to Pennsylvania. I thought, I'm leaving show business. I'm going to go into teaching and I'm going to get my degree back there because I felt it was a more stable place to teach and higher salaries and all this. And I, I got back there about. Um, I think five weeks before I decided to turn around and come back. So <laughs> it was one of those seven thousand dollar lessons, you know. <laughs> they kind of had to go through to like get it, you know. But I remember I rented this house in a small town, college town called Grove City, Pennsylvania. I put all my belongings in the house, got settled, just loved it. Initially loved it, the oh, countryside and small town life and and all this stuff and. Then I remember driving, my parents lived like 50 miles south, and I would go down and have dinner with them. And sometimes I'd just stay at, you know, in the bedroom where I grew up, and then I'd drive back to Grove City. But it was so remote, it was like out of Pittsburgh, and it would get more and more secluded, like in the woods, you know, and then we'd come to this little town, this Grove City, and I'd pull into this house. I remember friends, I'd drive at night. You know, you forget when you live in Las Vegas, we have these wide streets and, and bright lights, and then you go to other places in the country and you're driving at night and it's dark, you know. And I felt alone. So I remember it was one day, I was down with my parents and I you know, stayed overnight. And then I uh, drove up and there was a, I was looking for a table for this, a little table for this kitchen. And this, so I went to this mall. And I see all these old people just like shuffling around <laughs> the mall. Like that. And uh, nothing wrong with the walkers, but I mean, because I am a walker. Uh, but I mean it was like it was like everybody oh, nothing but the dead are dying back in my little house so I see all these gray heads like shuffling around and then I get up to this house and it's late late afternoon and, and I'm in this house alone and I just feel like oh what have I done oh I'm so alone and I was upstairs in this unair conditioned 1920s home in heat and, air, and uh, humidity and all of a sudden, I think I hear my name. Somebody's calling my name through the screen door of the kitchen. And I, what? My cousin and her husband. And they're calling my name, and, and they were spelled celebrating their 15th wedding anniversary in that area. And they wanted to take me to dinner. I got dressed. I was down the stairs so fast. I was so happy to, to be with other people, you know what I mean? We went to this restaurant back east. They have a lot of these, you know, it was like a home cooking restaurant. It was a converted house and everything was family style. You know, so you order like pork chops or whatever. And then they bring like the coleslaw on a bowl and you'd share that. And they had like ambrosia, you know, ambrosia, marshmallows and <laughs> coconut and, and uh, pineapple. And, and uh, they'd have these sweet, like all homemade stuff. I was in heaven. <laughs> you know what, I would just look back on that though and I think, you know, God even knows just moments of loneliness. He just knew, knew, that I, knew, knew I needed just, oh, I just got to have some people. Yeah, you know, And here are my cousin and her husband and this is their 15th wedding anniversary and they're spending it with me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, oh well. I mean, they spent just the dinner with me. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so God, God wants us to be with people, but there are going to be these times when He wants to draw us closer to our to Himself. Okay. Mark six thirty one. Jesus said to His disciples, "Remember, there were there were big crowds, and Jesus said to them, Come with me, by yourselves to a quiet place.'" And that's his call different times of our life. He, he wants us. We cannot get all, always in the crowd. There are times we have to, that, that's a principle we always need. But we're talking about these certain seasons when we really are alone. 
Jesus was surrounded by crowds, wasn't he, in his ministry? And he had the 12 with him nearly 24-7. And he'd often go someplace with just uh, James and John, Peter, James, and John. And at times he would go and spend time with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. So he was with people all the time. But we also see times where he had to get alone. Get to get alone. He was God with us. You know, that Emmanuel, that means something. God with us. So there he was right with us. And yet, even then, he had to get himself off with just the Father. He needed that one-on-one. -on -one. It was when he was exiled on the island of Patmos that the Apostle John was given the revelation. Yep. Exiled. Abandoned by. And it's not always death that separates us from someone big in our life. We just had to say goodbye to Juman and Bara and Lyra. And that was, that was tough. Yep. I don't know for the rest of you, but I'll tell you for me, because they, were, they just brought something into this place. Yeah, yeah. But I got a, uh, an email from him, uh, not last week, but the week before, and I thought I'd share it. Yes. This is actually June 8th. Do you have pastel dinner? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to read this in English. Yes. <laughs> some, some of it does have a little, you know, he texted, he, uh, you know, typed it. We arrived in Germany safely and have met Bora, that's their older daughter. Ever since we left America, our hearts are staying in USA because of our new family there. Oh, yeah. In the airplane, we have talked about our time in America and felt that God has blessed us through the Four Seasons Church. <coughs> Thank you again. We will miss you and all families in church. I will send our news again to you. Please give big hug to Stephanie and church members. <laughs> After the service, people. <laughs> we all hug. Group hug, okay? <laughs> And then he says, even though this Sunday we will be in Germany, and that was last week, our heart will attend Four Seasons Church service. Aww. Love from Juman, Bara, Bora, and Lyra. It's heartbreaking to have people we love go. And I'll tell you something else that can make you feel abandoned by illness. Not just people that will <coughs> desert you or, or that died, but an illness will, will make you feel totally alone. You can even have people around you, but they're not going through what you've gone through. And it's just you and God. That's the time for you and God. My friend Rick Engel, I prayed for him for years and years and years and years. And we'd get on the phone, you know, uh, no less frequently than once a month for, four, for almost 50 years. And I would bring up something about the Lord and he just, would, I could just, I could hear, he'd just get silent, you know. Then... He got Parkinson's disease. And I see a completely different man. And he's, he's, he's come to trust God. And, and he comes to appreciate every time I, I call him every so many days and say, we're, we're, just so you know, we're praying for you every single day. Praying for you every single day. I talked to him the other day on my way to San Diego. And he had to make a decision by the next day uh, to have whether to have surgery where they crack your head up and take, take, lift your skull put electrodes in your brain to stop the tremors, uh, reapply, you know, wow. brain surgery, and then they put, uh, then a month later you have another surgery to put the battery in your in your chest, and it's, it doesn't cure you, but it, but it stops this tremoring, and he said, well, he has these tremors that they'll just go on so long, and they'll be so painful, and his toes all curl up from pain. He has to actually un, un curl his toes, if, you know, because he's just wadded up after this thing. You know, I never had a life-threatening disease, thank God, but I had a cyst on my vocal cord, and, and that made me aware, because I couldn't um, talk, I couldn't sing, and I, and I, I very little, and I could talk, uh, I had to really watch how much I talked, because my voice would just wear out, and I'd be with a group of people at a party or something, and they'd all be talking and carrying on, and, you know, for me, yeah. to, not, to not be able to enter, <laughs> and I'd have to sit there. But it made me realize that loneliness. And I had a friend whose father was nearly deaf, and they'd be in social situations. Everybody'd be carrying on and stuff, and he couldn't hear half of what was going on. And I think that's that's abandoned by that's loneliness. Mm, solitary places. David was abandoned, not because he wanted to, not because Jonathan wanted to leave him, but the circumstances they could not be together. But in that four-year time is when some of the deepest, sweetest 
psalms that we can relate to were written by David. Songs, actually. Psalm 31, verse 9. Be merciful to me, O God, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. You know, when you learn to pray like that, you're praying. You need to be that honest with God and, and that descriptive about your situations. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. I am a dread to my friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten by them as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. People, that's abandoned. For I hear the slander of many. There is terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I have cried out to you. But let the wicked be put to shame and lie silent in the grave. Let their lying lips be silenced, for with pride and contempt they speak arrogantly against the righteous. We just saw that in, in San, Francisco, San Diego. Rainbow flags, bullhorns, you know, being called bigots because we're, we are walking the way of the cross. And this is what David's going through. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take <coughs> refuge in you. That's what we're talking about. This abandonment to God. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them in the, from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling, you keep them safe from accusing tongues. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed his wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. That last line, David's basically saying, I felt like I was abandoned. Ever have times like that where you can't figure out where God is? Because if you walk with God any amount of time, there are going to be times when you don't even know where he is. And the only thing that will sustain you is your faith in his faithfulness. Yeah. And he says, I, I didn't know where you were. I felt like I was abandoned. However, you were there. Mm -hmm. Job had suffered. Oh. You know, we talk about things that, that abandon us. People that can abandon us to death. His children all died. So he was abandoned in that way. And then his health was taken away. So he had that loneliness. And another thing that will make you feel desperately lonely and alone and abandoned is financial problems. Loss of a job or, or low income because everyone else, you know, oh, they just bought a new car, they yeah. just bought a new house. Or your friends, if you lose a job, they're still hanging out, but what do you have in common with them anymore? They're going out to dinner, but, you know, I gotta, you know, I can't afford that. And you'll be, you'll feel abandoned. And so Job had a, you know, three strikes there. You know, all three of those things. Everything taken away. And he said, after his trial, Job 42.5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see of thee. See, people can tell you about Jesus. We can preach about Jesus. We can watch teachings on television. We can, and that's all good. But until you have that for yourself, till you know what it is to lay claim to that abandonment. Now I know. I've been abandoned in certain ways, but Lord, I've abandoned myself to you. David was separated from his best friend. And this would be God's opportunity to really reveal himself to David as his true best friend. The one who never would leave him or forsake him and who was with him at all times. God's removed some people from my life over the years. I've thanked him for some of those. <laughs> Maybe not at the time, but I'll tell you, when I say, like, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. My brother's death eight and a half years ago was the toughest thing I've ever gone through because we were so close. You know, he was my older brother by almost two years, but we were only a year apart in school. So all my life, he was always like forging the... the like the path ahead of me. 
So when he had Miss Monroe in third grade, I knew I was in for trouble. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And when he said Mrs. Kaler was a nasty lady, I knew <laughs> Mrs. Kaler was going to be no fun. Yeah. And so my whole life went like that. And, and the only, I only had a few years that we were separated, and then we were together forever, just you know, working together and, and going to church together. And his death was sudden, and it was just such... Suddenly, I was the oldest one in the family. I was like, I was having my older, but now I'm it. You know? And it's just this, a, a great sense, you know, great grief, great abandonment in that first year was very, very difficult. And I, I did have my sister. I had, of course, I was married, and I thanked God I had Stephanie. But the pain was mine alone. And I would go out, and I just remember I would walk, and I would pray, and I'd put my sunglasses on, and I would begin to weep. Some of you know just what I'm talking about. And God would just be my refuge. He would just be the only one I could cling to. K. Arthur said, snuggle in God's arms. When you're hurting, when you feel lonely, left out. Let him cradle you, comfort you, reassure you of his all-sufficient power and love. We redid our backyard a couple of years ago. And it was all newly landscaped, and they put in those little saplings, you know. And then they put the little posts on each side to support them, and they tie the wires, and so the, they'll stand strong in the wind until they get big enough to stand on their own. And now most of the trees back there have grown to a sufficient size, and you still see those little stakes, but then you take them off and the wires, and it kind of looks silly, you know, because they're big enough to stand without the support. And that's what God will do in our lives sometimes. He'll kick that support out because he knows you can stand alone and he wants you to stand with him yeah. Amen. my friend Rita that you know about that has prayer ministry here that I've known her since for 40 years and uh, she was in her 30s back then now she's in her 70s I was in my mid 20s and then now I'm in my 40s <laughs> funny how that works but <laughs> When we first met her, she was really close friends with another, she, Rita is Dutch, and we had another friend, Elsa, who was English, and they were together like all the time. And then Rita was mature enough in the Lord that she felt it was time for them to, that the, that the emotional bondage was, was too strong. And she, be, she deliberately separated herself from this friend. So she'd still see her, but not on the basis, she, she, so she withdrew. And it was painful. For both of them, especially for Elsa, because she felt abandoned. It was, you know. But I have watched Rita mature in the things of God, and I've watched Rita grow in ministry because she obeyed God's voice that, that this was too close of a relationship. And it had to be cool, and God had to be her source. Austin Phelps said this it's been said that there is no great work in literature or in science that was ever wrought by a man who did not love solitude. We may lay it down as, element, as an element, elemental principle of religion that no large growth in holiness was ever gained by one who did not take time to be often long alone with God. Our families are a blessing given us by God. We celebrate fathers today. They're a blessing given to us by God. Friends are a blessing given us to by us to us by God. The church is God's blessing to us. However, there will be times when like David and his best friend Jonathan, you have to say goodbye to the big person in your life. And when the light flickers out, like David, the one thing that remains, as Oswald Chambers says, is looking in the face of God for ourselves. I want to close with a psalm that David wrote when he was separated from his closest friend Jonathan and abandoned to the Lord. It's Psalm 34, 1 through 10. David wrote, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Does that sound familiar? His praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. That's it. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted, and that's what abandon is, afflicted, hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. 
Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we are all going to have seasons of abandonment where we just feel so utterly alone, either by illness or the loss of a loved one to death or change in circumstances that just separates us from company. Father, we want to know you. As Oswald Chambers said, that we never, ever feel that sense of aloneness. But know that the big lights will flicker out here and there, but that you are our refuge always. And we know that only by just yielding ourselves and abandoning ourselves unreservedly to you. There might be somebody here who has never asked Jesus to come into their heart. You'd like to know God better, but you need to invite Jesus to come and dwell in you. And if anyone would like to, to pray to invite Jesus in, just raise your hand. Just take a moment. Just want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity before we close the service today. Maybe somebody's been telling you about Jesus, but uh, you've never prayed that prayer of asking God to forgive your sins and asking Jesus and anybody at all? <coughs> okay. And let us just pray. Father, we again thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the examples in your word. We see David, Lord, that you prepared to become king by isolating him from all support but you. And so we pray, mighty one, that you would always be number one, our refuge, our strength, our source of joy, and our source of personhood in you. Lord, thank you again, Lord, for fathers. I thank you for my own father who is now with you in heaven. And we thank you, Father, for families. We thank you, Lord, for our friends. And we thank you for company. And we thank you above all things, Lord, that you are, you are our friend. We pray, Lord, as we go to our homes today, Lord, that your blessing go with us. And I pray, Father, that you give us a greater hunger after you and after your ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Hey, we've got a birthday cake. Who, is, who has a birthday this month? Samuel, what day is your birthday? 27th. 27th is Samuel's birthday. Anybody else here today? I didn't even check to see who else was on my our list. Uh, the little um, Billy, if you know Billy, she's been bringing a lady named June, and her birthday is actually today, and it says Happy June's birthday. It's actually we thought she'd be here, so we we'll need to save a little piece for June for next we'll put it in the freezer. So uh, she's 91 today. Yeah. So we'll put it in the freezer and pray she doesn't break her teeth on it. Yeah. So have a piece of piece of birthday cake if somebody would kind of take charge and just cut the cake, uh, and we'll celebrate Samuel's birthday. And uh, have a wonderful day in the Lord. And remember, you can bring your baby bottles in for the Women's Resource Center uh, next week.